Let you know that today is a day that many Christians around the world are celebrating or observing um, as Ash Wednesday, which is the beginning of a season called Lent. So shh, and a holy hush came over the room. Um, but for, for many Christians, this is one of the holiest days of the year, and we will be observing it today, and Scott will be explaining more about that. Um, but Lent is a season of repentance of recommitment to belief in the gospel um, and dying to ourselves that we may live the resurrection life with Christ. And so as we sing today, I invite you to, um, to lean into this as we sing, Convict Us Again. One of the lines is, teach us to fear you and number our days. Um, and that comes from Psalm 90 where it talks about, God, give us a heart of wisdom to number our days, to know that we don't live forever, but that we are frail human beings, but we have the confidence in God that God is for us, so who could be against us? So I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we worship.
Still Mark Nelson, Professor of Philosophy. <laughs> and Director of the Dallas Willard Research Center. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our chapel speaker this morning, Dr. Todd Hall. Dr. Hall is a clinical psychologist and professor at the Rosemead School of Psychology at Biola University. He has all the right qualifications, including a BA, two master's degrees, and a PhD in psychology. He has authored dozens of peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, all in the right places. And he's a leading researcher on spiritual development, leadership and organization, and flourishing. All of that would make him a good person for us to hear from, but there's a particular reason why he is with us today. Dr. Hall is the recipient of the 2022 Dallas Willard Research Center Book Award. As some of you know, Dallas Willard was a Christian philosopher, pastor, and author of such books as The Spirit of the Disciplines and Renovation of the Heart. These books are modern classics and have inspired thousands of people in every branch of the church to become apprentices to Jesus. Dallas passed away in 2013, but his influence continues to grow. Uh, and the Martin Institute and Dallas Willard Research Center here at Westmont are part of that. Uh, we created an annual book award program in 2015 to recognize and encourage exemplary original scholarship that reflects the intellectual commitments that characterized Dallas Willard's work throughout his career. One of these commitments is to the development of models of the human person that shed light on spiritual transformation and can put it in the domain of publicly accessible knowledge. And this is where our speaker comes back in. Um, with his wife, Dr. Elizabeth Lewis Hall, also a professor of psychology at Rosemead, Todd Hall wrote a book that does just those things. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, their book, Relational Spirituality, weaves together psychology, neurobiology, and theology to show us what spiritual transformation is, how it happens, and what sorts of communities foster it and it was selected out of a large field of other excellent books as the winner of this year's book prize. It's a fine book, and I hope it'll be widely read in and out of Westmont. I won't tell you more about it now because I don't want to steal their thunder. Uh, if you would like to hear more, uh, Todd Hall will be introducing the book to the Westmont community today at the Provost Lecture in um, GLC Simmons Center at 3.30 p.m., so that's today, 3.30 p.m., and you are all warmly invited to attend. For now, please join me in congratulating and welcoming Dr. Todd Hall and Dr. Elizabeth Lewis Hall. Thank you, it is wonderful to be here with you this morning. Hope your semester is going well. I'm excited to be here with you to share a few thoughts this morning on this very important topic of connection, relational and spiritual connection. And I want to start off by sharing a little bit of my story that I think sets the stage for the struggles that many people are experiencing today. As far back as I can remember, my mom struggled with very significant mental health issues. And she left the family when I was about nine years old, quite young. And this led to a sense of disconnection with family, with friends, even within myself. I developed ways to protect myself from that pain, but in the end, they always backfired and led to more of a sense of emptiness and less authentic relationships. And this feeling of being alone and disconnected also seeped into my relationship with God. Throughout my college years in particular, I often felt very distant from God. I later realized that the pain and disconnection in my relationship with God was linked to these formative childhood experiences. You see, up through college, as I mentioned, I used my faith, and I still do this sometimes today, as a defense to shield myself from pain in three different ways. The Nike approach, just do it. The intellectual approach, and the spiritual, emotional, high approach. So there were times, the Nike approach, 
when I thought, if I just tried hard enough, if I just gave God my all, if I performed well spiritually, then I would find a sense of meaning, and more importantly, all this pain from my family would go away. But when I got to college, it all started to fall apart because God gave me a roommate who tried even harder, and that really ticked me off. You see, Joe was a paragon of virtue and discipline. The previous year, he led his basketball team to the state championship and got a perfect GPA. How would you like to have Captain America for your roommate? <laughs> what irritated me the most was that he would often spend all night praying rather than sleeping like lower spiritual life forms like myself had the bad habit of doing. I'm not making this up. I would occasionally wake up in the middle of the night and there would be Joe on his knees praying. And I would think, the nerve of this guy, who does he think he is making me feel guilty for sleeping? Because I wasn't about to give up my sleep for God. But this forced me to realize that I was really seeking praise and recognition. That my spiritual strivings were an effort to keep my pain below the surface. And this meant that I was cut off from my emotions and detached from God. Then there were times I subscribed to the intellectual approach. And I thought, if I just knew enough about God, if I just knew enough about scripture, about theology, then I would grow spiritually and all this pain would go away. But Joe was studying Greek and reading the New Testament in the original language, so he ruined that one for me too. And then there were times I pursued the spiritual emotional high approach. You know what I'm talking about, the camp high, right? I would go to camp, I would have the spiritual high, and when I would come down the mountain, I would think if I can just somehow hang on to this spiritual high, then I would grow spiritually and all this pain would go away. But in the long run, it didn't work. You see, we are prone to use our spirituality to disconnect from emotional pain, which then disconnects us from ourselves, others, and God. Over time, I learned that it doesn't have to be that way. Looking back, having Joe in my life was a severe mercy because it put me on the path toward the fourth approach to spiritual growth. The fourth approach to spiritual growth is the relational approach that involves living a connected life, a life in which your spirituality empowers you to face your pain with the help of loving relationships and with that love to grow more and more in your love for God and neighbor. It turns out that we are loved into loving. To find meaning and to grow spiritually, you must open yourself to be loved into loving. And as we observe Ash Wednesday today, we are reminded that the first step in receiving God's love is to repent of our sins before God, both individually and corporately. There is no other way. Being loved into loving is the only antidote to the social and spiritual disconnection that we are experiencing now at a societal level and in our individual lives. And we're going to spend the next few minutes today unpacking what this means for your spiritual growth and development. I want to talk this morning about three principles of the connected life. Relational connections, the purpose and process of spiritual transformation. Second, attachment filters, how relationships shape our capacity to love. And third, spiritual tipping points, how little experiences cause deep change. There was a time in my life when my busyness got out of control. I had served three years in the Army as a psychologist, and I got out of the Army, and that's when I went back to Biola and started teaching. For some reason, I felt I needed more training in statistics, so I went back to graduate school at UCLA nearly full-time while teaching full-time. And this was driven a lot by my insecurities. After a few years of this crazy pace, my life started to come unhinged. I was doing all of this good work, but it was at the expense of the people right in front of me, at the expense of loving the people in my life, my family, my students, my clients, my neighbors. I lost focus on my purpose. I got caught up in efforts to manage my insecurities, and I lost sight of the big picture. And I think we all do this, don't we? We constantly lose focus on our primary purpose, our common human vocation in this life. 
we get off track and we begin to live mundane, mediocre lives. But it doesn't have to be this way. It is really possible to live a life in which you practice your primary purpose, which is to grow in your love for God and neighbor. It's possible to live a connected life, but you have to constantly invite God to refocus you on practicing your purpose. When Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment? He replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is your primary purpose. Your primary vocation as a human being created in the very image of God. It is to fully accept your obligation to persevere in your love for everyone in your life, for your neighbor. And love requires two things. First, that you seek the good of others, which in its fullness requires that you know them. Second, that you be present with them in a way that promotes mutual closeness. And so let me ask you today, are you practicing your purpose of loving God and loving your neighbor? I would encourage you to take some time this week and today to reflect on how you are practicing your purpose to grow in your love for God and others. Think about your relationships, the choices you make, the habits you've developed, the practices you engage in, and the values you live out. We've talked about the purpose of your spiritual journey. What about the process of spiritual growth? How does it work? Part of the reason I used my spirituality to push away my pain is that it felt safer than being vulnerable with God and others. There were times I reached out to others hoping to be seen and known, only to be hurt. Do you ever have those moments when you feel like being vulnerable is absolutely the stupidest thing you could ever do? I think we all feel that way sometimes. I think we all fear the pain of not being accepted for who we truly are. And so we disconnect from others to protect ourselves. And that's totally understandable. But it's also tragic. The tragedy is that when you disconnect from others, you also short circuit the relational connections that transform your soul through love. In Ephesians 3, 17 to 19, Paul offers this prayer for the Ephesians. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you will never fully understand it. Spiritual transformation is a relational process in which you become more loving by taking in more and more of Christ's love for you. But to take in love, you have to be vulnerable, and that's scary. We grow not only in our direct relationship with God, but also in relationship with each other in the body of Christ. After working so hard to use my spirituality to push away my pain and to not look at my sin, it all began to fall apart my junior year of college. A lifetime of pain was crashing in in all my relationships and I just couldn't make them work. And no matter how hard I tried, I felt empty and distant from God. It was probably the first time, but by no means the last, that I came to the end of myself. And I realized I was trying to do this spiritual journey on my own. And I realized I needed God and people in my life to help me. And so inside my soul, I turned to God. And God showed up. One day, I was wandering around campus after some relationships had fallen apart. And I wandered into our chapel for no apparent reason. There was somebody speaking. And I sat down in the back. And to this day, I have no idea who the speaker was, what the topic was, what the conference was. But the speaker said something. And through it, I heard God speaking to me. It wasn't an audible voice, but it was an immediate impression. 
And what I heard was something like this. There are some things inside of you that you need to face. And you need me and others to help you. And I will be with you. And I will guide you. And that put me on a different path. That day, I began to open myself to God in new ways. And and I began to reach out to others in my life in new ways. And it was scary. And it still is at times. But God was present. And he used some wonderful people in my life and wonderful mentors to help me grow. To grow spiritually, you must open yourself to be loved into loving. This week, I would encourage you to be vulnerable with a trusted friend in a way that moves you just outside your comfort zone. I mentioned that it was difficult and scary for me to open up to others. The reason is that I had a filter operating for close relationships that said something like this, if I open up to others, they will let me down and hurt me. This is what I expected to happen at a very deep gut level. And this caused me to become very self-sufficient until the walls I built came crashing down. So what are these filters and how do they change? This is the second principle of the connected life attachment filters, how relationships shape our capacity to love. Our deepest sense of who we are is shaped most profoundly in our closest relationships, what psychologists call attachment relationships. The clearest examples of an attachment relationship are a parent-child relationship and your relationship with God. But you can also become attached to a mentor, a close friend, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, spouse. You become attached to someone when you rely on them for two things. Comfort when you're upset or distressed, and an internal sense of security or secure base that allows you to explore the world, both internally and externally. What happens is that patterns that occur in your important relationships are etched or encoded in your gut level memory as expectations of how relationships work for you, of how to be with others. In other words, you remember how important people in your life feel about you, not in words, but in your emotions. And these memories function as attachment filters that shape how you experience and relate to God and others. We all have attachment filters that cause us to repeat unhealthy relational patterns. We relate to others on the basis of what we know through our own experience. And the bad experiences sometimes seem to drown out the good ones. Toward the end of college, I began to open up to God more, as I mentioned. And as I did that, I began to realize how my experiences with important people in my life affected my relationship with God. There was one day in particular that I was praying, and I realized that I had this feeling deep in my gut that I needed to hurry up and finish my prayer quickly, as if God had something more important to do. And it's not difficult to connect the dots between that experience of God and some experiences that I had with important people in my life. But thankfully, that was not the ending point of my journey. Instead, it was a beginning point of realizing what I really believed about God deep in my gut. Your relational patterns, your gut level experiences of God can change. But the first step is you have to become aware of them. I would encourage you to spend some time reflecting on this question from David Benner in his book, Surrender to Love. And then share your experience with God and with a friend. Imagine God thinking about you. What do you assume God feels when you come to mind? For a long time, my attachment filter with God caused me to feel that he was not for me. But by God's grace, that wasn't the end of the story. When I began to gain access to this deep gut level belief about God, I was able to bring it into relationship with God and with other people in my life. And as I did that, I had a number of very particular experiences that caused a spiritual tipping point, a deep change in my gut level expectations 
of God and others. This is the third principle of the connected life, spiritual tipping points, how little experiences cause deep change. Malcolm Gladwell popularized the concept of the tipping point in his book of the same name, The Tipping Point. The tipping point is the moment when deep change takes effect. These moments are only possible, however, because of many smaller changes that have come before and prepared the way. You can't manufacture spiritual tipping points, but you can participate in the kind of experiences that facilitate them. Spiritual practices prepare the way for spiritual tipping points. But they don't function like vending machines, doling out spiritual highs. And I found in my own life, and I'm working with clients for nearly 30 years now, that tipping points are often caused by moments of deep connection that shift your gut level expectations of how relationships work for you. What we might call a moment of meeting. I want to show you a brief clip from a movie called The Martian Child. For those of you who haven't seen it, The Martian Child is a story based on a true story, by the way, about a recently widowed science fiction writer named David Gordon, who adopts a boy named Dennis, who believes he is from Mars. Dennis, who's been abandoned numerous times, expects David to leave him too. But as he opens his heart a little bit at a time, he finds that David is different than the previous parental figures in his life. No, you weren't bad, and you gotta stop saying that, all right? I don't want you to cut your feet, and Daddy, I'm in here working. We gotta put this camera away for a little while, okay? But I haven't finished my mission. Well, you have for today. But I haven't finished my mission! Give me my camera back! I need it! Hey, you gotta calm down. I have to go to work, or you can go to your room. Dennis, why would I send you away? Because you're mad at me. Because I broke your stuff. Dennis, I don't care about any of that stuff. This is stuff. There's nothing you can do that would ever change the way I feel. Do you understand? I'm not going to ever send you away. Look, this is just stuff. Break it like you mean it. Okay, that's a great clip, isn't it? <clears throat> this was a tipping point for Dennis. He expected deep down that yet another parental figure was going to send him away. His gut level expectations of rejection were online in the moment with David. But instead of that experience being reinforced, David meets his fear with perfect love for that moment by showing Dennis that his love for him is unconditional. It was a moment of meeting that shifted Dennis's attachment filters. But you know, before this tipping point, there were many moments when David felt like nothing was going to change with Dennis, the young boy. But he held on, and he continued to open himself up to connection with Dennis. He continued to love Dennis. He could have shut down. He could have walked away, but he didn't. Somewhere deep down, he knew that Dennis loved him too, and that it was just waiting to burst out of him. And when he saw that he had access to Dennis's deep-seated expectation of rejection, he knew he had an opportunity for a moment of meeting, and he took it. So when you see in your friend 
a deep-seated expectation that others will send them away or reject them or criticize them. And it's live in the moment, and you have access to it, and you have the opportunity to meet your friends' expectations with perfect love for that moment. Do you seize the opportunity? This week, I would encourage you to look for an opportunity for a moment of meeting. And when you see one, take it. Before this tipping point, there were many moments when Dennis, the young boy, felt like nothing was going to change. You see, for him, parents always send you away. That's just how it works. But some part of him held on and opened himself to connection with David. And when David invited him into a new relational space, a space where you can break each other's stuff and still love each other, he opened his heart to David just a little bit more. This morning, God is inviting you into a new relational space. It's a space where even if you break his stuff, he will still love you. It's a space created by the blood of Christ where nothing you can do will ever change the way he feels about you. And if you step into that space, God will be there with a love that is so deep and so profound that you will never find its limit and you will never exhaust it and you will never reach its height and you will never plumb its depths and you will never be outside of its boundaries and you will never, ever, ever be separated from it in this life or in the next. So this morning, as we begin this season of Lent, I would invite you to open your heart to God just a little bit more and you will be loved into loving. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. That was a marvelous and faithful word. We're loved into loving. We become aware of our need for love, start to believe it, and then it starts to come out of us. We become aware of our need for grace. We dare to believe that the grace of God is for us. It starts to make its way into us. And it starts to come out of us. This whole season of Lent, maybe you didn't come from a tradition where the church calendar or church seasons were anything. Um, I didn't even grow up in the church, so um, I'm still learning all this. But I've become so refreshed by the idea of particular seasons to remember intentionally. Uh, Mother Teresa, the little faithful nun who changed the world with her tenacity and compassion for the least of these said, don't be surprised by my holiness. We are made for this. And Scott Lasea said, uh, we do not lapse into holiness. <laughs> Have you noticed that in your own life? It doesn't just sort of happen. If you go with the flow, you don't just sort of become more holy. It's this idea that Todd just shared with us, that there's a way for us to participate in the very thing that God wants us to grow into, this rightness, this shalom within ourselves, between us and God, as a community, as a living presence in this world. When uh, John the Baptist came ahead of Jesus as a messenger, as the voice in the wilderness, he came and he preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And one of the results is that people were coming out to the countryside to hear this wild prophet who was not careful with his words, and they started confessing their sins. Can you imagine that if something happened at chapel and the result was we just started confessing our sins? to God and to one another. There's word uh, out of Asbury of possibly a revival uh, amongst this generation. 
revival is always accompanied by this awareness that, oh my gosh, I do not have it together. I need God. So what a great season for us to intentionally come and uh, enter into this season to remember intentionally that we need the love and the grace of God and that we're designed to have it come out of us. We're loved into loving. So let's just take a moment here and then afterwards there'll be four stations up here, two in the corners where we have some different pastors from our community with us. We have uh, Elizabeth Molitors from Trinity Episcopal. We have Tom Haugen from El Montecito Press, John Ireland from Ocean Hills Covenant, Mark Severson from Montecito Covenant, and Father Lawrence from um, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Um, and there, you're going to have a chance in silence to come and what they call the imposition of the ashes. Just have the mark of the cross put on your forehead and they'll say something over you, something like repent and believe in the gospel or from ashes you came and to, or from dust you came, dust you'll return. Just receive that, but let's spend a moment here as they take their places um, in 60 seconds of just quiet and, uh, and participate with the Lord. Maybe you need to confess your sin uh, to the Lord. And maybe the Lord would invite you to do that with a brother or sister later today. Well, let's come in silence. And um, there'll be some scriptures that'll be on the uh, screen to guide our time.
This Thursday night, there's a national day of prayer for college students, and we're going to join a simulcast at 5 p.m. in Clark A., I believe. We'll let you know uh, if it's different than that. But all are invited. It's just in the spirit of whatever the Spirit of God is doing uh, in our midst, we want to participate with that. Would you stand up and receive the benediction as you're able? I bless you in your allowing yourself to be loved by the mighty love of the the Father for you, that it would go into you deep and come out of you joyfully to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.